Cairo, Seattle. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal, a show about famous people and the stories behind the foods they love most. Today on the program, Julia Quinn, best-selling author of dozens of historical romance novels, including the Bridgerton series, which was recently turned into a fantastically popular Netflix show produced by Shonda Rhimes. There's all of these foods that are associated with romance, chocolate, and people talk about Mm -hmm. these aphrodisiac foods like oysters. Do you believe in that? No, I'm so lame. I'm like the least like romantic romance writer you probably ever meet. Bridgerton is set in England's Regency era, a period spanning from 1811 to 1820, which is the same era Jane Austen's most popular books came out. But there is very little mention of food in the Bridgerton books. So I called on Paul Couchman, a food historian who calls himself the Regency chef. He offers Regency era cooking classes and catering at the Regency Townhouse, a restored 1820s mansion in Brighton, England. And back on this side of the pond, when you think of a classic Seattle food, you might think of salmon. But to many, including me, Pho is the city's signature dish. I chat with former Washington Governor Dan Evans and the co-owners of Pho Bak, the city's first pho shop, about how pho became ubiquitous in Seattle. If you go around Seattle, every block has a pho shop. It's like a Starbucks. You know, Seattle would know for coffee. Seattle would know for pho. But first, my conversation with Julia Quinn. So you've been a New York Times bestselling author 19 times, 18 of those were consecutive. Your books have been translated into 29 languages, and yet people still love to make fun of romance novels and act like they are lesser than any other book. Why do you think that is? I think that our society tends to devalue anything that is perceived as the feminine. And romance novels are written by women, for women, Um, Nancy Pearl, who you're probably familiar with if you're a woman about Seattle. She um, has been on the show as a guest as well. I am not surprised. But Nancy Pearl said something which has always stayed with me. And she said that literary fiction is always judged by the best of its examples. And romance is always judged by the worst. Hmm. And it's true. They find the most over-the-top, crazy, bonkers romance novels that they can and make it sound like that's what everything is. And it's just absolutely not true. There's fabulous writing in there. I think as a society, we also don't place high value on stories that highlight emotion and love. And then, you know, the old time cheesy covers, I don't think particularly helped, but. Yeah, the Fabio covers don't help. I know. And that's the funny thing. You can't have a story about romance without somebody bringing up Fabio. And he actually has not been involved in the industry since the mid nineties. And we still can't get rid of him. That and can't believe Uh, it's not butter. He's tied to both forever. Like the second most common question I would get after where do we get your ideas is have you met Fabio? Fun fact. Romance is the top revenue generating literary category in the United States. Half of the paperback books sold in the U.S. are romance or erotica. No matter how poorly the publishing industry is doing, no matter how bad the economy is, Romance always sells. And Julia Quinn is only one of 16 writers to be inducted into the Romance Writers of America Hall of Fame. As a teenager, Julia loved reading a teen romance series called Sweet Dreams, which jump-started her romance novel writing career. I was reading them over the summer, and my dad, you know, I don't want to make him out to be a total literary snob or anything, but... He's thinking maybe I should be reading Conrad. And I'm like, yeah, that's just what, you know, a 13-year-old girl wants to read on break. <laughs> so he asked me why I'm, I'm doing it. And I said, well, I'm going to enjoy it. I mean, really like it. And he said, yeah, but I want to know, what, what else are you getting out of it? And I said, well, vocabulary words. And he said, can you find me a couple words in this book that you don't already know? <laughs> and I could not. So, so then I was like, well, I'm reading them for research because I'm going to write one. And he said... Okay. And so he sat me down in front of the home computer. And this was 1983. So hardly anybody had a home computer, but we did. And it was this little Osborne with a tiny little screen that was maybe, you know, an eight inch screen black with the blinking green cursor. 
the program was called WordStar, which I'm pretty sure has not been in existence for decades. And he said later that he fully expected to see me 20 minutes later being like, all right, I'll read the Dostoevsky, whatever you want. But I didn't. Two hours in and I was hunched over the computer and I was typing away. And over the course of two summers, I wrote an entire teenage romance. It's very aspirational. You know, the heroine was the girl in the school plays, like me, who never gets a boyfriend, also like me. Um, And then suddenly, you know, she captures the eye of like the football star, which was not like me. So I did this. And when I finished, I sent it off to the publisher. And I was rejected so fast that I know they never read it because I know how publishing works now. Nobody gets rejected that quickly. But Julia got her revenge. She was published right after graduating from college. I sold my first two books in a two book deal the same month I got into medical school. And I did go for about two, three months before I realized this is not the right thing. And I withdrew and have been writing full time ever since. And I have not looked back and I am married to a doctor. So you know I know what the other side could have looked like your sliding doors moment. Yes, I know exactly what I'm missing. And I, I am 100% convinced I made the correct decision. <laughs> Especially now, he is actually an infectious disease specialist. It's a big year for him. Up next, we're going to go to England to hear how the Bridgerton family would have eaten 200 years ago. Julia Quinn's Bridgerton is set in England's Regency era. That's 1811 to 1820. It is sandwiched between the Georgian and Victorian periods. And I was super curious to know what people ate during this time. So I called up Paul Couchman. I think I'm a historic cook and I give online courses and do caterings, things like that as well. Paul helped restore the kitchen in the Regency townhouse a huge multi-story house right on the water in Brighton, England, built in 1820. It's now a museum and heritage center with a functioning kitchen in its basement. One Christmas, I started making mince pies downstairs from an old recipe. And I stood there in that old kitchen, you know, making my mince pies, the pastry and stuff, and the mince meat and all those smells. And I thought, I'm standing here in the same place a servant would have stood, making the same thing. You know, and you get this sort of rush of, you know, you get this feeling on on your skin of of just going back in time. And it was just so beautiful. And I thought, I want to share this with other people. I want other people to feel like this. And so we've got a team of people now that join in and cook or or did (laughs) before, uh, before lockdown. Paul said the Regency townhouse would have been a summer home for rich folks, like the Bridgerton family back in the day. When Paul popped on the screen for our Zoom call, he was dressed in a puffy-sleeved white shirt, a la Seinfeld, and a green vest with white buttons. This is all um, proper Regency shirt. There's a place near Brighton, Lewis, that makes them. And so every day for work, is this how you dress? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) When I'm doing the courses and when I'm doing the presentations at at the townhouse, yeah, exactly. Paul says if you were to come to dinner at a well-to-do Regency-era household, the table would already be covered with food when you arrived. As each course was eaten, the empty serving dishes would be whisked away by servants and new dishes would be put in their place. So these are the sort of things that would have been on the table. It would have been fillet of pork, lamb's head, calf's ears, almond pudding, stewed carp, beef steak pie, onion soup, that would probably be first, sheep's rumps, china mutton and some veal collops. What did you say, china mutton? Sorry, um, chine. It's a it's a cut. Chine of mutton. Oh, it's chine of mutton. I was like, what's a chine yeah, of mutton? <laughs> <laughs> chine of mutton. So you imagine all these dishes. And what people did was they used to serve each other. Gentlemen would hand dishes over to the ladies and serve them. All the servants will help out in moving all these dishes around. And then you get a dessert at the end when the whole all the tablecloth is taken off. You've got the polished table and you have things like nuts and jellies and little sweet cakes and things like that at the end. Some of the recipes that Paul learned to make from this era come from a tattered handwritten book gifted to him by a woman who found him on Instagram. He says it was really common for a household to have a personal handwritten cookbook containing the recipes they cooked most. We think 1780s to 1820s, it's hard to date them. It says at the back, finished 1831, which is nice. I don't know when it was started. Well, you won't be able to see this on the podcast, but I can hold it up for you on the the camera here. Just a small notebook. In the front of it, it's some calves leather and inside it's cloth paper. 
So that's why the books are in such good condition is the paper can last longer because it's made from cloth. And people just gave up their old clothing and make it into paper. But these are really special because they also show what people would have actually cooked. So yes. these are very, very valuable sources of um, historic information, really. I'm so envious of you. I want to hold that book so badly. I want to <laughs> I look through it. Like I have this feeling in my body of like, I just want to lay in bed and look through that whole book. It's so cool. Yeah. Paul reads a recipe from the book for sparrow dumplings. Did you say sparrow dumplings? I did say sparrow, yes. Okay. <laughs> Let me just find it. Oh, there we go. Right, here we go. Sparrow dumplings. Mix half a pint of good milk with three eggs, a little salt, as much as will make a thick batter. Put a lump of butter rolled in pepper and salt into each sparrow. Mix them in the batter, tie them in a cloth, boil it an hour and a half, and pour melted butter over it. They don't know who the book belonged to, but Paul hopes it was a servant, since their handwriting and their voices are so rarely represented. Paul says being a servant meant you got to eat the leftovers from these delicious, elaborate meals. So let's say you weren't a servant and you were just a poor person living on your own. Do you know much about what they would have cooked for themselves? Yeah, yeah. Ovens were really um, only for the rich. And that really carries on to about the 1920s, you know, in Britain. And so you've got some way of making water hot. And what they used to eat was a lot of puddings because you can actually put puddings into cloths. This is how they did it. It's a bit like those old fashioned Christmas puddings, you know? I always need a reminder but, because puddings are different in the yeah, US than they are in the UK. Like to us, it's creamy chocolate pudding. And a pudding so, in the so, UK is like kind of a, just a cake, a dessert. No, 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 it's really different. No, no. Have you heard of haggis? I know the word. I know it's in like a sheep's stomach. Is yeah, very right? good. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Well, basically a, a pudding is a sort of haggis. Haggis is a pudding. You, you basically have something soft. That's inside something else, which used to be like a sausage. A sausage is a pudding. Okay, you so know? it doesn't. It's definitely not sweet. It's well, it can be sweet. That's the thing. Okay. <laughs> you've got a sort of casing. You've got something soft inside it, and what you can then do is boil this thing. Okay. And that's what a pudding is in England, anyway. And then you and would slice it. People. Exactly. Okay. Peas pudding is a very good example. Very cheap. So it's it's dried peas. They're cooked up. They're mashed up, and they're put into a cloth, and they're boiled. When you take the cloth off, you can actually slice pieces of this piece of pudding and have it eat, to eat. It's really nice. That's basically poor food. That's what the poor would have been eating. It was also common at that time to write a recipe in rhyme so the illiterate could memorize them. Six ounces of bread, let your maid eat the crust. The crumb must be grated as small as the dust. So Six at that time, of course, the plague was an issue. And so there was some integration of medicinal foods that people would eat. What are some examples of that? Yeah, so at the back of this book, and this is quite common in these um, recipe books, for English cholera, it's something about peppermint water, 30 drops of ether. Oh, that sounds awful. So I've got cholera, I've got worms, I've got toothache, I've got a cough. <laughs> some of these things do have you know, medicinal qualities, and some of them did actually help people. But a lot of it was just, you know, a bit of a bit of rubbish, really. I was going to say not... rubbish, if I may use one of your words. Yes. Yeah. I've got a, a wine jelly for weak people. Just general um, weak people. <laughs> <laughs> it has, yeah. There's a beef tea as well. For, it's a sort of strengthener. English food has a reputation for being bland, pretty uninteresting, not that great. But during this time period, they cooked with garlic, they ate spicy food, and they made good use of the spices that had come over from foreign lands. Things like long pepper and mace and turmeric. Paul's favorite is a popular condiment called piccalilli. You've got things like cauliflower and carrots and onions, things like that in it, in a sort of pickled sauce. So there's vinegar in there, there's turmeric, there's garlic, there's ginger, um, there's some sugar in there as well. So it's a bit sweet, it's a bit sour. And it's this beautiful, vibrant yellow color as well, piccalilli. So it's very English. And they had another thing called lemon pickle, which I've made as well, which is basically like preserved lemons. If your meal was a bit bland, then you'd put these sauces together with it to spice it up. Paul says cooking in the Regency townhouse is a dream come true. He even loves doing the dishes because it means he's standing in the exact same place as a scullery maid would have stood when she was doing the dishes. Paul says it's the best way to time travel. When you're cooking in the house, these smells will go round the house. The kitchen wasn't used for about 100 years. And so to bring that back to life, you know, to actually when people come in to see this historic house, they can smell the meals that would be made there. You know, that makes it really special, doesn't it? 
when we come back. Remember in the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, how the dad thought that Windex was a cure-all and he was always spraying everybody with it? Well, Julia reveals her family's cure-all, something her children are firmly rejecting. We'll be right back. Julia grew up on the East Coast in a Jewish family, but now she lives in Seattle, which is where she's been raising her children. My mother is the typical Jewish mom who thinks that chicken soup can cure everything. I mean, like you have a rash, you should apply it topically. Um, (laughs) I have a Jewish mom too, so I understand. You understand. You know, growing up, we had chicken soup so much. It was not a special occasion thing. It was not a when you're sick thing. It was like that was a staple chicken soup. So she lives very close by and still like anybody's got a sniffle. She's like, I have soup in the freezer. You know, <laughs> If someone gets a burn, you can rub the icy soup on it. I know there's always soup in the freezer. <laughs> I raised my kids in the Pacific Northwest. I have Northwest kids and somebody, I don't remember which one had the sniffles, had a cold. And my mom's again, I have soup in the freezer. I'll bring it over. And my kids were like, we don't want Nana's chicken soup. We want pho. Oh my God. And it was like you had stabbed my mother through the heart. And she's like, what? what? And so, you know, I went out to my favorite pho place is pho back. That is Seattle's first pho restaurant, actually. I know. And we even have the t-shirts that say Pacific Northwest. So anyway, I would get stuff from pho back and I bring them back. And that's what my kids wanted when they were sick. They didn't want Nana's chicken soup. They wanted pho. Well, fast forward a couple of years and my mom is sick. And so I'm like, well, do you want me to make you chicken soup? Because I'm like, I have some in the freezer, right? It's probably <laughs> the stuff she made and threw it over there. In this little tiny voice, she's like, do you think you could get me some pho? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And for people who are listening who don't live in Seattle in the Pacific Northwest, pho is so ubiquitous here that basically mm-hmm. everybody eats it, you know, from children to construction workers. It is not foreign to people in this region. Right. And it's usually a beef based Vietnamese soup with rice noodles. And it is so delicious and inexpensive and fast. Yeah, you go to the back that is on your table so fast. And it's so aromatic and so herbaceous. I feel like it is really good when you're sick because all of those herbs, it's not that it clears your sinuses because it's not spicy, but it kind of opens up like you can't smell very well when you're sick, but you can actually smell and taste this because there's so much more flavor than chicken soup has. I might have to get fun tonight. At the crib, stuffy head, sick with the cold. Take the chicken noodle soup can and throw it out, bro. You under the weather, boo-boo, you need this hit. A boiling broth full of the beef brisket. Washington State has the third largest Vietnamese population in the country. And in Seattle, Vietnamese pho is as American as chicken soup. But the question is, how did pho get so popular? And why is there such a large concentration of Vietnamese immigrants here? Julia's favorite spot, Pho Bac, was the first pho shop to open in Seattle. That was in 1982. But the story starts years before that. I think it was 1974. The war in Vietnam was ending and uh, the uh, fall of Saigon was just happening. And there were many Vietnamese who felt they had to simply get out of the country. They were fearful of what would happen when Saigon did fall. That's Dan Evans, governor of Washington State from 1965 to 1977. In 1974, a plane full of Vietnamese refugees touched down in San Diego's Camp Pendleton. I was getting up one morning and listening to the radio and heard Governor Jerry Brown of California say he didn't want any Vietnamese there. And in fact, one of his aides attempted to even keep the plane that was coming from uh, Vietnam from landing at an Air Force base in California. I was just furious uh, when it stormed over to my office, ready to tell my staff we've got to do something. And they were already uh, furious about it. Uh, We sent a young aide in my office to Camp Pendleton And he called me back and said, Governor, you'd be amazed at the kind of people that are here. They're professionals. They're just all sorts of very talented people. I said, invite them to come and and settle in Washington State. Uh, They did come. And in the meantime, we had uh, gained 
large number of volunteer families who agreed to uh, each one take on a Vietnamese family when they arrived and act as a guide and helper until they got settled. A little bit later, after that first plane arrived, Governor Evans welcomed a group of 6,000 more Vietnamese immigrants. And then another big wave arrived by boat. And these folks hit the ground running. They were looking for work. It wasn't until 1981 that Pho Box original owners, Teresa Cat Vu and Augustine Nian Pham, arrived in Seattle. And as their daughter Quinn Pham told me, it took them four attempts and six years to get out of Vietnam after the fall of Saigon. Obviously, the first one, two, three attempts, they uh, were caught. Once you're caught, you're in the re-education camp. My dad spent years in there. One of their last attempts, my oldest sister was probably one years old. My mom was pregnant with me, and they attempted to escape the country, and they got caught. And so once again, my dad was thrown in education camp. They threw my mom and my, old, my oldest sister into, and uh, my mom was just telling us that, you know, it was really rough conditions. She was about eight and a half months pregnant with me, and then she went into labor <laughs> in jail. Uh, they took her to the, like, the jail hospital, and that's when she had me. And after that, though, they felt, I can't have a newborn baby. And, a, and so they actually released my mom, myself, and my sister. But my dad was still in jail for like almost another year until he was released. Of course, the family loves to tell the story about how Quinn was born in jail. Eventually, the family made it to a refugee camp in Thailand. Then they were sent to another camp in the Philippines, where they lived for two years before leaving for Seattle, where they had family. Kat and Augustine were savvy. They were natural entrepreneurs who owned several businesses in Vietnam. So only six months after arriving in the States, Kat opened a sandwich shop. Here's their other daughter, Yen Vi Pham. They did like to be their own boss. They didn't like working for anyone. And they scrambled some money. And with the support of the city, everything, they opened um, Cat Submarine, which is my mom's name, Cat. And uh, she did what she thought Americans wanted, which is American sandwiches. <laughs> uh, my mom used to throw lavish parties. Like, my mom is a social butterfly. It was a very small Vietnamese community then, so everyone knew each other. They'd come over to our house, they'd throw lavish parties, sing karaoke, drink a lot of Hennessy and Remy. And uh, my mom used to make big meals, like pho and like all these things. And she was a very good cook, even though she didn't start cooking until she came to America. Because oh. in Vietnam, you don't need to cook. There's food everywhere. <laughs> so like, she started making food, and she was very, very good, very savvy at it. And then all her friends came, and it was a lot of the door, and like everyone wanted pho. And next thing you know, she had to make pho every day. <laughs> and then, like probably about six months into the business, they changed it to pho bak, which is, means pho of the north, because they're originally from north. And um, that's the story. And then that's how pho bak happened. What's up, dude? We eat pho, dude. You like tripe? Yeah, I. Right. So do we too. Yenvi says her parents helped friends and family members open their own pho restaurants. Sometimes her parents would open a new location and then sell it to a cousin. They sponsored Vietnamese families and let strangers sleep in their home until they got adjusted in Seattle. And soon enough, there was a little village of pho restaurants opening in Seattle and cities beyond. And I like to give a little credit to Governor Evans for bringing this rich culture to the region. My wife Nancy and I went and greeted the first group. Two months later, uh, my assistant came into the office and said, you'll never guess what's happened. One of the Vietnamese families that was on that first bus uh, had five children, and the wife was pregnant with their sixth one. When she gave birth, of course, he was the first citizen of the United States, having been born here. And in honor of our welcoming them to the state of Washington, uh, named him Evans. So Evans win. We got to uh, know the family, and uh, we have been in close touch with them ever since. And the first five children in order were valedictorians of their class. When Evans was due to graduate, I was a little concerned because late spring and we hadn't received any invitation to their graduation ceremony. And my assistant checked into it and came back in laughing and said, well, they were ashamed to invite you because Evans was not valedictorian. Of course, he was in the top ten. They're, they're marvelous citizens of the state. We eating hella good in the city by the sea. For back, for bit, for sick cloud, ton tau, maybe ton bros, a ton V. Okay, so back to Pho Bok. Kat and Augustine have since retired, so Quinn, Yenvi, and their brother now co-own and run the original restaurants. 
and they've opened new ones with a modern spin. Yenvi experiments with new recipes, Quinn designs the new spaces, and their brother is more behind the scenes. He does the business and the bookkeeping. With some rice noodles, in some beef broth, basil in the mint leaves, drown in the hoisin sauce. And I suppose this is a good time to talk about exactly what pho is. So it starts with an aromatic beef broth. Just at Pho Box Soup Shop, they sell 650 to 700 bowls a day. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they always have a cauldron on with beef broth boiling. Pho is actually very labor intensive. That's why people usually don't make it at home because it's easier to just buy it. (laughs) We'll do the hard work for you. It's really about the quality of the ingredient. For us, it's all about the bone. The bone to water ratio is so important. So lots of bones. (laughs) We do sardines. We do um, cilantro seeds. We do cloves. We do, I don't know what it's called in English, but it's called tao kwa, which is, I think it is a dry date, but it's a very kind of licorice aroma. Um, we always add ginger and onions. Inside the bowl of steamy aromatic beef broth is a nest of silky rice noodles, thin slices of raw white onion, some scallions and cilantro, and whatever meat you choose. On the side, there's a little garnish plate, so you can add a squeeze of lime, some fresh basil, some freshly sliced chilies, and bean sprouts. Some people like to add hoisin sauce and a little bit of sriracha for heat. And everybody likes their bowl of pho a particular way. After talking to Quinn and Yenvi, I started to wonder if it was kind of like a horoscope or an indicator of personality. Quinn, who you'll hear first, is more of an introvert. And her sister Yenvi is a social butterfly with a big laugh. Here are their perfect bowls of pho. I like a thai ball vian, which is a steak and meatball. And then sometimes I'll add a piece of tendon in there. And I like my broth really clear, so I don't add any sauces or anything. The only thing I add is uh, I squeeze two limes, add some black pepper, a little basil, and that's it. (laughs) No, my bowl's insane. Okay, my perfect bowl. Of course, like, you know, beef broth, noodles. Noodles, super chewy. And then I like to put beef belly, thinly sliced steak on the side, fatty brisket, of course, meatballs that have been simmering in the broth, and then I like to have a side of vinegar onions with hot sauce, and then I like to have a scoop of fatty broth on top of my pho, and then, <laughs> and then I dip my meat in the onion vinegar hot sauce mixture as I eat. Old sriracha, hoisin, sambal, <laughs> and black pepper. <laughs> oh, I always have to have a side of Chinese donuts. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. As for the history of pho, I'll let Taylor Huang tell that story. She's owned Seattle's pho ciclo restaurants for nearly two decades. Pho originated from North Vietnam in a very small town called Nam Din. It started, I think, in 1906. It was a result of when the French colonized Vietnam. Before that, Vietnamese didn't really eat beef. Beef was seen more as an animal of labor. But when the French colonized, they started to slaughter cows. And then Vietnamese were using the leftover parts, including the bones and the tendons and they couldn't really make a meal out of it, so they decided to make a soup. The word pho is said to be derived from the French soup, pot a feu. And get a bowl of Vietnamese noodle soup. Like, What's up, dude? We eat pho, dude. You like tripe? Yeah, I right, so do we too. What is this podcast called? Your Last Meal? Okay, I think it's time to get to Julia's last meal. What would your last meal be? I guess it would be sushi and ice cream, so it's my favorite savory and my favorite sweet. I love going into a sushi restaurant and telling the chef, make us like a chef's choice roll and surprise us. That's always really fun. I love doing the omakase where you get surprised and you don't know what you're getting. And what's your favorite ice cream? Almost anything, honestly. As long as it doesn't have bananas. That's like the one thing that I hate. Like I detest bananas with like a visceral passion. It's taste, it's smell, it's texture. Everything. I just, I mean, I hate bananas so much that like if I'm on an airplane and somebody peels a ripe banana, it that's like an aggressive attack. <laughs> well, going back to ice cream though, I'm gonna make you choose. So you like everything, but let's say you know you're at the store. Like if you could only pick one. If- oh my gosh. Well, it really depends on the mood. I love a good dulce de leche or salted caramel. I did recently splurge on an ice cream of the month club from Jenny's, J-E-N-I. Oh, have you tried the new one that's all over social media, the everything bagel ice cream? Have you got sent that yet? 
that sounds weird, but no. That is her newest flavor. It can taste like the toasted onion and garlic, but everybody is saying it's really good. I'm very curious. Well, we'll see if we get sent that. Ice cream is definitely my weakness. I can't have it in the house. I read that you were on the weakest link and you actually won quite a bit of money. Uh, I so did. I thought that I would give you a little bit of a food quiz and see how you are at culinary trivia. Oh, dear. So okay. Okay. Mexican ceviche is made by marinating raw fish in what type of liquid? Lime juice. That is correct. Blueberries are native to which continent? North America. That is correct. Ooh, okay. I, I, was, I was not sure of that one. Okay. Okay, you're from the East Coast. You might know the answer to this one. What was the first food item added to the menu of Friendly's restaurants other than ice cream? Oh, no. Okay. I have to tell you, I used to work at Friendly's. <gasps> you did as a teen? I, as a teenager, yes. I was a, that's really funny you said this. I was a waitress at Friendly's. And when I got there, one of the warnings they gave us was when you were scooping the ice cream to switch from hand to hand, otherwise you would develop what was known as scooper's boob. Scooper's boob? Scooper's boob, which is an overdeveloped pectoral muscle. Like, so if you're right-handed on, on your right side. None of us knew if Scooper's boo was real, but none of us were willing to risk it. So we would switch back and forth to avoid Scooper's boo. But okay, so Friendly's, what was that the first? That is so funny because I've heard of doing that so you don't have like a big forearm, but never a Scooper's boo. That is good advice. Yeah, Scooper's boo. So I can't believe you asked me a Friendly's question, but Friendly's have been around a long time before I worked there. The first food item, I guess I'm going to go with a hamburger. You are correct. That is right. Oh, okay. I still have weird like dreams. Like I'm waiting tables at Friendly's. Here's another one. What does okay. dim sum translate to in English? Oh, I knew this once, but I'm quite certain I could not think of it. So I'm going to, I'm just going to give up on it right now. It translates to, to touch your heart. Okay. I never knew that. I'm, I'm absolutely wrong. I never knew that. I'm going to ask you one more because I want you to go out with a bang here. And I think you'll know. This I know one. I started so strong. I know you did. You're going to have more friendlies. You're going to have nightmares about this podcast that you, that you couldn't get the answers right. Where was the Caesar salad invented? Oh, oh, that was in, um, it was like in Tijuana or something like that. Yes, you are correct. Woo! I keep wanting confetti to fall from the ceiling. Or chocolate sprinkles. And that was Julia Quinn's last meal. Go to juliaquinn.com for all things Bridgerton and to learn more about her other historic romance novels. There are dozens. Thanks to Yenvi and Quinn Pham, owners of Fubak, Fubak Soup Shop, and the new Hello M Cafe and Roastery. This is where I met the sisters for the interview, and it is this super cool Vietnamese coffee shop. I had a breakfast banh mi that was honestly the best bite I've had in months. It was so delicious. Once Yenvi was done making fun of me for not drinking caffeine, she made me a steamer, so steamed milk with pandan. And I've never tasted anything like this drink. It was topped with their signature egg cream, uh, which is a mix of condensed milk and egg yolk. And they also do an egg cloud. Everything is so good. It's so special, so unique. Go to Hello M and try for yourself. If you guys want tips, when you're in Vietnam, this is how you do it. <laughs> if you're in Saigon, you wake up at 6. You go to all the little stalls, eat 10 different meals. At 10 a.m., you take a stroll in the shade to walk off your food. Go back to your hotel, your Airbnb, sleep until 4 or 5, get ready for dinner, eat dinner and hang out at night until about 2 or 3, go to sleep, wake up again at 6, <laughs> and eat more because the best food is either really late at night or really early in the morning. You can follow them on Instagram at Fubbox Seattle, P-H-O-B-A-C Seattle. They have a new restaurant coming soon. Yenvi has been designing the menu, and it's food that I have never, ever seen on a Vietnamese menu before. So make sure and follow along so you can check that out. And a big thank you to Sabzi, DJ Sabzi, who used to make music here in Seattle with the Blue Scholars. He let us use his fuss song. It's called What's Up Fam, and it's one of my favorites. Thanks to Paul Couchman with the Regency Townhouse. You can follow him on Instagram at the Regency Cook to see the historic kitchen, to see the recipes that he makes, and to connect with him to arrange an online cooking class. Oh, and Paul said he noticed one small food-related error when he was watching Bridgerton. There's one time when they talk about gooseberry pie for dessert. 
and the gooseberry pie actually would have been on the table for the second course at the same time as the main course. But that's just a little thing. You're probably the only person. <laughs> <laughs> the only, good, only person who knows that, which is kind of fun. <laughs> Make sure and follow me on Instagram. I'm Hello Rachel Bell. That's B E L L E. We brought back the Quarantine Cooking Club last week. We all made meatballs in honor of the 100th anniversary of your last meal. So make sure you're following so you don't miss out. Oh, and don't ever miss an episode. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, hit subscribe, hit follow on Spotify. And if you're listening on Stitcher, you can favorite your last meal. This episode was produced by Laura Scott and me. Original theme music by Prom Queen. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal. 